Hey guys, Tyler here. If you're anything like me, then, well, after Avengers Endgame, uh, you kind of lost interest in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, you know, once the Infinity Saga was over, I just couldn't bring myself to be interested in these stories anymore. When they announced a Loki series, I kind of rolled my eyes, to be honest. I thought, he, he'd die. We saw him die on screen, for real this time. Was it a prequel, an alternate timeline? Actually, that second prospect was a pretty intriguing one, I'll be honest. We all love what-if stories. The Star Trek franchise is full of them. Not just episodes about fixing time travel mistakes, but uh, also the interaction between Starfleet crews and their counterparts from other universes. As I learned more about the way that the Loki series was continuing the MCU story after Endgame without undoing or cheapening Loki's death, I had to check it out. All this talk of diverging probabilities and a bureaucratic temporal agency that oversees the timeline, uh, it, it reminded me quite a bit of Gary Seven in the Star Trek original series episode Assignment Earth, or the Department of Temporal Investigations, or DTI in Deep Space Nine, or Daniels in Enterprise. Now this isn't a review of Loki, per se, although I did enjoy it quite a bit. Rather, I wanted to examine some of the parallels between uh, both Marvel and Star Trek's time travel agencies, and determine how each agency's motivations relates to the way that history itself unfolds. Warning, there will be some spoilers for Loki in this video. So with all that, let's get started. In Loki, a variant of the trickster god himself is arrested in 2012 by the Time Variance Authority, or TVA, not the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is uh, what I first thought of when I saw the acronym. This version of Loki escaped the Battle of New York with the Tesseract, which houses one of the Infinity Stones. As Loki is informed, this isn't supposed to happen, and the TVA resets the timeline to resemble its intended path. Loki stands trial for his crimes, but instead of being sentenced to be executed, he's instead uh, enlisted by Owen Wilson, aka Agent Mobius, to help the TVA track down another variant of Loki who has been vandalizing TVA property across the multiverse. Naturally, we learn a lot about the TVA, uh, its protocols, its history, its modus operandi, in this six-episode season. And much of this information is, of course, adapted from uh, various Marvel comics. According to TVA propaganda, the organization was created and is overseen by the timekeepers, uh, beings who exist at the end of time and are tasked with dealing with the consequences of the so-called multiversal war. Kind of sounds like the temporal cold war, eh? The TVA was first featured in issue number 372 of the Thor comic in 1986 as an homage to Marvel continuity expert Mark Grunewald. Grunewald also helped devise the classification system for different Marvel realities. This is where the name Earth 616, for example, comes from, referring to the main comics continuity. Now, if you're like me, even if you were paying close attention during the runtime of Loki, you might still have some questions about uh, the show's time travel mechanics and uh, its multiverse mechanics. It's a little confusing. Once again, we learn that the TVA's MO is to prune different branch realities that diverge from the predetermined path of the sacred timeline. But if this is the case, then how are so many different versions of Loki across these different realities able to be born in the first place? What I mean is this. When it comes to all these variants of Loki, and not just him, everyone else for that matter, their crime is not so much existing, but rather creating nexus events uh, that set the sacred timeline off its intended path. The reason the TVA wants to stop these nexus events is because in their minds, letting all of these different realities continue unabated would cause chaos, such as another multiversal war. But the inhabitants of each of these realities is just as real as the Loki and the other characters who we've been watching for years. They're just subtle variations of the same person, manifesting across different permutations of the MCU. I briefly touched on this subject in my video about Star Trek's mirror 
universe. According to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, all possible outcomes of an event exist simultaneously and are stacked on top of each other within the same 4D space-time, or 12D if you believe in string theory. And furthermore, the entire universe has a uniform wave function that doesn't collapse when an outcome is observed, unlike in the Copenhagen interpretation. Once each outcome is observed, it only really affects the other inhabitants of that particular quantum reality, as at the macro scale, these realities do not normally uh, interact with each other. The way that Loki screenwriter Michael Waldron explained it is this. If you zoom in on the timeline, it's uh, not so much a straight line as intertwined strands of a rope. Each of these strands is a stable quantum reality, and in some of these realities, uh, Loki is female or has some other uh, difference in his appearance. But as long as these variants don't deviate too much from uh, the right history in the long run, they can continue to coexist alongside each other as basically different quantum states of the single MCU. It's a bit of a different take on the multiverse than we've gotten in uh, other media, admittedly, uh, but one that is just as deterministic. All of these Lokis were born on Jotunheim, raised on Asgard, and are supposed to die at the hands of Thanos, but all the variants that we see on screen made different choices to escape their intended fate. Here's an analogy. Uh, imagine an entire week of your life. In that week, let's say every morning you get up and eat breakfast before you go to work or school. God help you. One day you might have cereal, another day you might have uh, bacon and eggs, another day you might have a burrito. But the order that you eat those breakfasts in doesn't really matter as long as they all get eaten by the end of the week. Call me Mike Huckabee, I got these food metaphors. All right, this isn't a perfect analogy, but it does illustrate the point that as long as all these different quantum fluctuations follow a similar enough path, they'll still end up in the same place, which is entropy and the heat death of the universe or whatever the Marvel equivalent is of that. This is one of the reasons that uh, variants of different people are able to hide out in apocalypses. They don't really change the timeline because anybody that they interact with is going to die anyway. Besides Loki and Owen Wilson's little trip to Pompeii, we see this in practice with one of the female variants of Loki, who has dubbed herself Sylvie. She's on the run from the TVA and is hiding out in different apocalypses uh, to escape detection until Loki helps the TVA sort of figure out her plan. We find out that Sylvie was arrested as a child by the TVA, uh, but escaped before she could be sentenced. When she's detained again later in life, she asks Judge Ravana Renslayer, and that is definitely a Marvel name if I ever heard one. What her original crime even was, what her Nexus event was. And Renslayer says, I don't remember. Again, Sylvie's crime is not so much being born or existing in the first place, but creating this Nexus event. As our protagonists figure out though, uh, because the TVA does not have the supreme authority over the timeline that it claims it does, then perhaps letting all these branch realities continue to exist and allowing their inhabitants to exercise free will is maybe not such a bad thing. We'll have to see what happens in season two. As for Star Trek's DTI, we don't really learn a lot of information about it in the one episode where it's mentioned. Two of its agents, Marion Dolmer and Gareth Luxley, whose names are anagrams of the X-Files characters Mulder and Scully, debrief Benjamin Sisko uh, after the Defiant crew gets back from its little jaunt to stop an assassination plot against James T. Kirk and reintroduces the Tribble population to the galaxy. They're on screen for mere minutes. Um, but multiple Star Trek novels, including the DTI series, uh, actually expand greatly on the department's inner workings, as well as uh, Dolmer and Luxley's personal lives. DTI agents' thankless job, which entails a lot of paperwork, just like the TVA, uh, is one of the only things that is keeping the timeline from unraveling, at least from their perspective. But as I mentioned earlier, the DTI uh, isn't the Federation's only active temporal agency. By the 29th century, uh, the Temporal Integrity Commission, or TIC, maintains dedicated Starfleet timeships, such as the USS Relativity seen in the 
Voyager episode, Relativity. And of course, in the 31st century, temporal agents such as Daniels monitored the timeline and intervened during crucial moments in history, such as uh, after the Zindi attack. All of these temporal agencies exist to make sure that history adheres to the way it has been originally recorded although they do not always succeed. The Zindi attack and illicit activities by the Suluban Cabal lead to lasting permanent changes that basically overwrite Daniel's original history, with changes permeating at the speed of interaction into a new alternate future. For a more in-depth exploration of Daniel's and the time travel and enterprise, you can check out my video on the subject. Link will be in the description box, as well as a card. Do people still do the cards? Is that a thing? In any event, a number of paradoxes and time travel events have led to the history that we call the Prime Universe in Star Trek canon. All of the agencies we see on screen defending the Prime universe are uh, working, according to themselves, in the best interest of the Federation. But while the DTI and TIC are effectively government agencies, as far as we're aware, one powerful, influential temporal organization uh, in Star Trek explicitly works outside the Federation. Way outside. I'm referring, of course, to the Aegis. Uh, a group of highly advanced aliens who employ operatives such as Gary Seven, as seen in Assignment Earth. Now, the Aegis are not mentioned by name on screen. Their name comes from various non-canon sources. But we do learn quite a bit about Gary Seven's uh, origins and his mission in Assignment Earth. Gary Seven is tasked with making sure that humanity doesn't destroy itself with nuclear weapons. No small task in the mid-20th century. Failing his mission would of course prevent Earth from becoming a founding member of the Federation later on. Gary Seven is human, uh, but as we learn, his ancestors were abducted from Earth around circa 4000 BC uh, and taken to a faraway concealed planet. He was bred and conditioned in a way that uh, effectively gives him a flawless, healthy body and uh, he is immune to the effects of, for example, the Vulcan nerve pinch. Together with his shape-shifting cat, Isis, yes there is a shape-shifting cat in this episode, Gary Seven successfully aborts the launch of a nuclear missile which would have accelerated Earth's World War III, indicating that the launch was probably not part of the original recording of history and perhaps might represent a front uh, of the temporal Cold War. In licensed works, the Aegis for whom Gary Seven works are usually depicted as non-humanoid, bug-looking creatures. They're able to move freely through time at will as are their operatives, who are equipped with long-range transporters that can beam them over thousands of light years of space. But despite their direct interference in Earth's past, their true goals are to preserve history as best as they can. Various novels and comics describe how the Aegis uh, will extract members of other species, including Cardassians, Romulans, and others, to breed operatives to work in the interest of galactic peace and stability. The location of the Aegis homeworld is unknown, and in fact some sources claim that they are extragalactic in origin. But the planet where Gary Seven was born and raised uh, is, according to some sources, some 50,000 light years from Earth. And in fact, a draft script of the Voyager episode Prime Factors had the crew finding this planet in the Delta Quadrant. If Loki's TVA is analogous to Star Trek's DTI, or TIC for that matter, then the Aegis are analogous to the Timekeepers, except real and not androids. The DTI and TIC, after all, work for the Federation, whereas the Aegis have an agenda of their own. They're effectively a faction in the Temporal Cold War, uh, although their actions for the most part are in accordance with the Temporal Accord, and their uh, relationship with any other factions is unknown. They're interested in maintaining history as best as they can, though the true scope of their knowledge is uh, not in and of itself totally clear. That is to say, while the Aegis uh, may not be omniscient and are certainly less powerful than the Q, they are said to keep secrets from their own operatives as well as other temporal powers. Thus, we can only assume that the Aegis are on the side of humanity uh, and various other civilizations in the Milky Way because they say so. There are numerous other differences between 
uh, the TVA and Trek's various temporal agencies. In the realm where the TVA operates, time just flows differently uh, from the normal universe. The TVA is also far more militaristic, employing hunters and minutemen to apprehend alleged criminals. Sentences for temporal crimes can be harsh, and the judges who hand down those sentences are themselves brainwashed to believe that they were created by the timekeepers instead of, uh, well, being abducted from various points throughout the timeline. Yep, that's another parallel between the TVA and the Aegis. They both seem to love abducting people. But besides these temporal agencies' moral attitudes, the entire act of preserving the timeline presents yet another interesting philosophical question. It's totally understandable how various time travel agencies would want to intervene uh, to stop bad actors from gaining power or cause massive suffering. But let me ask you a question. If you had the power to stop Hitler from rising to power, would you do it? I think many of us would say yes, absolutely. I mean, just think of all the atrocities that were committed by Nazi Germany under Hitler's leadership. If Hitler hadn't risen to power, if there were no World War II at all, then millions of people would have never died. Except we can't really just say that and call it a day, unfortunately. If it hadn't been for World War II, then fascism and eugenics would have taken longer to be discredited, and Japan would have still persisted for years as an imperial monarchy. The conditions necessary for the rise of fascism in Germany would have still been there, and while the dropping of bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was, in my opinion, one of the evilest things that the U.S. has done, it did demonstrate to us the full scale of their devastation. If it hadn't been Hiroshima and Nagasaki, then nuclear weapons probably would have been used in Korea, and if not Korea, Vietnam, and thousands or millions of other innocent civilians would have been killed on top of the ones who were already killed in those wars. Okay, if you don't like the World War II example, let's just back up a bit and uh, you know, undo the conditions that led to the rise of Nazism in the first place. We could tweak the terms of the Treaty of Versailles, or have the Central Powers win World War I, or just prevent World War I altogether. Except, not so fast. While those world wars brought on some of the worst devastation that our species has witnessed, fighting them and dealing with their consequences has taught us some very, very important historical lessons. Lessons that, unfortunately, we still are uh, struggling with, but lessons nonetheless. And one positive outcome of the World Wars, uh, some of our youth, aside from any technological benefits that may or may not have existed, is that they sped up the process of decolonization. If the World Wars hadn't been fought when they were, uh, then they inevitably would have been fought later on, most likely, and fighting the world wars with more advanced military technology would have led to even more devastation. So it makes sense, then, that temporal agencies would have a vested interest, not just for themselves, but for the good of everyone, to preserve history, including both the good and the bad. If human history were less bloody and violent, then we would obviously want to do everything in our power to preserve that timeline. But because we live in the world that we live in, we have to understand that any changes to history, no matter how righteous in intent, could have untold consequences. This is one of the lessons of The City on the Edge of Forever and other stories about time travel. I have to admit, I struggled quite a bit in trying to uh, figure out how to write this video. The parallels between Loki and Assignment Earth were just so clear in my mind that I had to say something about them. But upon further investigation of Loki and the other time travel stories I've discussed today, uh, I came to realize just how much these stories can act as allegories for human beings coming to terms with our own flaws. In fact, this is one of the other big themes of Loki, accepting your flaws and utilizing that towards a better end. As many have noted, without all the negative attributes of life, the positive attributes would be much less appreciated. Without pain, we don't grow. Without suffering and loss, we don't come to appreciate 
what we have. And without the darkest chapters in human history, we don't learn very important lessons to help guide us towards a more positive future. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I'm really interested to hear your thoughts in the comments. There's a lot of stuff I discussed in this video. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of contention as well, so have at it. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a thumbs up down below and don't forget to share it. That stuff really helps me out. It really does. If you haven't subscribed yet, be sure to do that as well uh, so you won't miss any future uploads and click the bell icon to receive all notifications. If you think I deserve it and you want to support the channel even further, you can become a member or a patron. Links to those as well as my social media and merch store are in the description as well. That's about all I have for this week. I'll see you in the next video.